Today, we're going to explore the lore as it was understood in 2007, a time when Outland was the first mysterious step into this big unknown cosmos for so many players. Since then, of course, the lore has changed significantly, let's just say, with things like Illidan's reintroduction and us literally meeting Sargaris. But the way in which we appreciate the lore has changed even more. We were small characters in a big world, a world that contained far fewer answers than today's. So, the lore of World of Warcraft has changed, we have changed, and the game itself has changed a lot. So, let's step back, and let's get into the mindset of a fledgling Karazhan Raider or an Arena Challenger, and present the lore as they understood it back in the day. From the downfall of Sargaris to the construction of the Dark Portal through to all of the, well, the new lore and the new concepts that Blizzard introduced with this expansion. Now, we are about to unveil our big Patreon revamp, but suffice to say, if you head over there right now, you'll actually see a whole bunch of new content. Fresh podcasts, hours of content, even our new lore podcast. Also, physical loot and a whole bunch of other cool things as well. So... Head up that Patreon to support content like this, and let's go. Okay, let's go way back, because right now, we kind of know exactly who Sargaris is, and all of that stuff. We even helped lock the guy up. But back in the Burning Crusade, all that people had was scraps of text and old game manuals. Real lore buffs might have known that Sargaris was the looming villain in the background of Nax's War of the Ancient series, but until the Burning Crusade, he was, well, nearly non-existent in-game. Suddenly, the Burning Legion needed to be a hell of a lot more real in World of Warcraft. We discovered that the Titans had self-appointed the task of ordering the cosmos, but the demons, a sort of wild native force of the universe, would just turn up and destroy all of their work. So we then learned that the Titans appointed Sargaris to wage war against said demons. Now, Sargaris quickly discovered that the demons, in fact, respawn in the Twisting Nether, making his whole war feel a little bit pointless. Now this sowed the seeds of doubt in his head. He resolved himself, though, and he got back to imprisoning demons. But this was a stopgap, because the demons were endless, and Sargaris' doubts only grew and grew as time went on. Now, the older lore essentially just had Sargaris fall into despair from this, turning on the Titan Pantheon, with it potentially being a possibility that the Nath regime helped corrupt him know that at the time, this was all extremely shrouded in mystery, a far cry from being able to open up Warcraft Chronicle today. But regardless, his doubts, Sarkaris' doubts, they manifested physically, splitting his metallic skin, revealing this furnace of pure hate. So he decided that if war against the demons was hopeless, that order was indeed folly as a concept, uh, that basically he, along with this infinite army of demons that he would free and subjugate, that they would scour the universe clean. And that is what was established as of the Burning Crusade. But quite a bit more happened because, well, a bunch of the lore was about to change. Sargaris knew that to destroy the cosmos, his legion would need leaders. The Nath regime found the world of Argus, the Aradar, and their big arcane-driven civilization. So Sargaris personally approached the three leaders of the Aradar, of course, Archimonde, Kil'jaeden, and Velen, and as we know, he promised them power beyond their wildest imaginations. Now this is all lore that we saw, that we played firsthand in patch 7.3. But at the time, this was new, this was fresh, and this was a departure from what people actually thought regarding the Aradar and the Legion, because there previously had been a question over who came first, Sargaris or the Aradar. Some early theories had it that the Aradar were actually natural demons and that they corrupted Sargaris. 
there was actually even a point where, on the official Blizzard website, both versions of the lore existed. One version with the Aradar always being demons, and then the new Burning Crusade lore, uh, where of course the Aradar were corrupted by Sargaris. They were actually hosted simultaneously, even though they're conflicting, on Blizzard's site back in the day. Alright, back to the lore. So, the Aradar, Velen, foresaw Sargaris' treachery, and he tried to warn the other Aradars, Archimond and Kil'jaeden. But the pair of them shot Velen down, so Velen called out into the cosmos for help. And this is where a sentient creature of light, known as Kuur, reached out and offered a way to escape. So, of course, Valen and his followers boarded Kuur's dimensional ship, which was called the Ganadar, and they escaped Argus as the other Aradar went and joined with Sargaris and the Burning Legion. Those refugees took on the name Draenei, exiled ones in their native tongue, and they traveled the cosmos for thousands and thousands of years, always one step ahead of their Legion hunters, until they ended up crashing on Draenor. Now, this is where it's interesting, because at one point, the in-game lore, I believe with Auchendoon, suggested that they had spent thousands of years on the world of Draenor, and that the orcs had pretty much just got used to them almost being there. But, but, Rise of the Horde, the novel, actually put it at over 200 years that the Draenei had been there, not thousands, and that rough timeline is what Blizzard have actually stuck with since. Now, an arrow aboard that ship called Duor was killed outright with the crash, and some people even speculated at the time that the crystal that Morgrain found in Blackrock Mountain, the one purified into the Ashbringer, uh, that was in fact a fragment of a dead Naru. So this is all big new fresh lore with these new Naru creatures. Now as for Kuur, well, Kuur was entombed within the Janadar, and was on the brink of falling into its void form. So to keep itself from turning, Kuur began to influence the religious practices of the planet's natives, the Orcs, who would then offer blessed water and prayers to the Naru, basically keeping it from going void and consuming Outland. The Orcish Kosh Harg festival was then even relocated, and they gave the Ganadar the name Oshugun. Of course, they very much didn't believe that it was a bizarre alien spaceship. Now, the Draenei, with no way to leave this world, then built their civilization. Now, all was good until their past caught up with them. Kil'jaeden, now a demon lord of the Burning Legion, had been chasing Velen for thousands of years, and he was pissed at Velen for, well, quitting on them in the Legion. With, of course, the Draenei being trapped in Draenor, Kil'jaeden realized that this time he had enough time to play with to really ensure their destruction. So, he saw promise in the orcs and decided to use them as instruments of his revenge. Uh, we know the story, but it was retold for the Burning Crusade, right? So, we had known about the first war and the stuff that went down in Draenor, but in the Burning Crusade, it changed for the Draenei. You see, the Draenei were previously referenced in a single sentence of the story, but now they were central to the telling of that story. There was a massive expansion of the Draenei lore on Draenor, and that came along with TBC. So, through Gul'dan, Kil'jaeden slowly subverted the decentralized orcs into the militaristic horde. Gul'dan then gathered the orcs' shamans at Ashugun, convincing them to become warlocks instead to worship demons. As if that wasn't enough, and before locking in their fate with the drinking of Manoroth's blood, the orcs waged their big war of extermination against the Draenei, burning their cities, killing their civilians, and driving them to the edge of extinction. Then, Velen led a few survivors into Zangermarsh, where they would hide for the next 20 years. So we had these Draenei hiding out. Those Draenei were different to what players previously thought the Draenei were, which was a Kama and his fellow Broken, but we'll get on to that. So with the complete domination of the planet, the Shadow Council, which is Gul'dan's warlocks, they constructed the Dark Portal, 
and with the help of Medivh, they invaded Azeroth. Now, whilst all of this stuff was happening, Sargeras' essence was, of course, actually trapped inside Medivh. That's why Medivh did all that bad stuff. So when Anduin Lothar killed Medivh during the First War, well, Sargeras' essence was in there. And that meant that Sargeras was banished to the Twisting Nether, meaning that he was essentially helpless to interact with our realm for a bit, and that left Archimonde and Kil'jaeden in control of the Burning Legion. The Horde, fresh off its victory in Stormwind, then turned to Lordaeron. But this is where the Alliance forces led by, of course, Khadgar, Turalyon, Lyria, where they actually fought a really strong defense, eventually becoming an offense, where they pushed the Horde all the way back through the Dark Portal, back to Dranwar from whence they came. Now, at the end of the war, Khadgar destroyed the Dark Portal, but there was a problem in that the rift between these worlds could never truly be broken. That link was essentially always there. Now, the Horde, which was now in disarray, fell back under the influence of Ner'zhul, who had planned to basically open dark portals all across Draenor. Now, this big, big spell essentially tore the planet apart, spitting sections of the planet out into the Great Dark and turning Draenor into the broken world of Outland, which is where the Burning Crusade would take place. Now, Khadgar knew that the destruction from all of this would actually filter back through to Azeroth because of the link between the worlds, and that it would do untold damage. So, in a moment of ultimate sacrifice, he decided to close the remaining portal from the Draenor side, trapping him and his friends on Draenor. Now, whilst on Draenor, Khadgar and Velen simultaneously reached out to the cosmos for help. And this is where the Army of the Light heard the call, and they sent the dimensional fortress of Tempest Keep to Outland. That's why Tempest Keep ended up in Outland. For the next two decades then, Outland would essentially just become a Burning Legion backwater that was lorded over by Magtheridon. So you have these Legion people, you also have the Sons of Lothar trying to just hold on there, and of course, Valen and his Draenei. Now, the Naru, as we know, had felt some significance with Outland, and they had sent their dimensional fortress of Tempest Keep. And what's funny there is it does mean that the Army of the Light technically were helping us before we, the players, even knew they existed. Now, you'd be forgiven for thinking that the Legion is the primary antagonist of the Burning Crusade, but for Outland, they really weren't. And this is something that confused a lot of players. Because, while they were both a bit demony looking, Illidan and the Legion are absolutely not friends. The love triangle between Illidan, Tyrande, and Malfurion was more prominent in those older renditions of the lore, where, feeling scorned, Illidan joined the Highborn of Ashara's court just before the War of the Ancients. Now, the Highborn dabbled with dangerous magic and Illidan actually seemed supportive of the summoning in of demons to Azeroth. Illidan even impressed Sargaris so much that Sargaris gave him the gift of uh, great power. But of course, Sargaris took his eyes in return. Now, although the Highborn did consider Illidan to be an ally, which will be important later, we do know that he ultimately was working as a double agent and that he was, of course, instrumental in ending the First Legion invasion. The thing is, though, Ilden could not accept the destruction of the Well of Eternity as a price for victory. So, he ended up taking seven vials of its water. Now, when he tried to recreate the Well of Eternity by pouring three of these vials into uh, a lake on Mount Hyjal, Malfurion and the wider Night Elf Society were basically furious, and they imprisoned Ilden deep beneath the mountain. Later, Illidan would, of course, give a vial of eternity to Lady Vash, with a further vial being used to create the Sunwell. And those vials of eternity would, of course, be something that people would get as a part of their attunement in the Burning Crusade. Now, of course, there is one outstanding vial we haven't covered yet. We know that goes to Lady Vash, so let's talk about how. 10,000 years later, when the Legion launched its second invasion, in the game, Warcraft 3, Tyrande would free Illidan, hoping that he would be a key asset in the war. 
Malfurion was uneasy, but was willing to give him a chance. Sadly, Ilden was quickly baited, though, into absorbing the powers of the Skull of Gul'dan, and he was baited by Arthas. This infused fell Illidan had extreme power. It's where he got his big demonic metamorphosis power from. Now, the Legion was eventually defeated at the summit of Hygel, with Archimonde dying as he tried to consume the energy of Nordrasil. Now, this left Kill Jaden as the supreme commander of the Legion forces. Now, although Illidan did fight the Legion, he was irrevocably changed by the fell magic, and he was banished from Kalimdor for this. In exile, he was actually then enlisted by Kil'jaeden to kill the Lich King. But Illidan would need allies to do this, so he called into the depths of Azeroth and summoned up the Naga, led by Lady Vash, who would become the first lieutenant of the Illidari, his new army. Now, the plan was to literally shake Northrend apart with a ritual done in the ruins of Dalaran. Whilst there, Vash came into contact with Kilthas and the Blood Elves, who then, of course, quickly joined up with the Illidari. Now, the ritual to shatter Northrend itself, uh, well, that actually failed. And instead of facing Kil'jaeden, Illidan thought his best chances was just to run, so he used a rift through the Twisting Nether that was created from the summoning of Archimonde, and he escaped to Outland along with his new buddies. Of course, one of which, Lady Vash, would get a Vial of Eternity. And that's how both Kel'thas and Lady Vash have the two vials, and those are the vials that are needed as a part of your attunement that ultimately gets you into the Hyjal Raid in the Burning Crusade. Well, now we know how Ilden and the gang first ended up in Outland, but we've got to talk about the Blood Elves, because they were, at the time, called the High Elves. And, just before all of this, they actually served the Alliance. So, the High Elf victims of Arthas' Scourge ended up renaming themselves as the Blood Elves to honor their fallen. Now, they ended up after the events of Warcraft 3, when the Scourge had been unleashed and all of that stuff, as a part of the Alliance, helping out the Alliance, trying to defeat all of the Scourge. Now, this was a big, grinding war, and they were thrown into impossible odds in these Alliance battlefields. They were not happy. In order to overcome these impossible odds, Kel'thas ended up having to ally with a bunch of Naga that he met just to survive. Alliance Command really did not like that, so the Alliance imprisoned these elves only for Lady Vash to free Kel'thas. And that is how Kel'thas and Vash met, and that led to Illidan promising Kel'thas a solution to his people's magic addiction. Yeah, the Alliance no longer seemed like the right choice, so basically he flipped over to Team Illidan. A few things happen, and of course they end up in... Outland. So, the gang is in Outland. Beginning the Hellfire Peninsula, the Illidari fought a campaign to close all of the Legion portals in Outland, because they wanted to kick the Legion out and claim the world as their own. But the Legion still held something super important, the Black Temple. The Illidari were massively outnumbered, and they needed a way to crack the temple. And this is where the gang meets Akama. Akama was a Broken, and a Broken is basically a type of devolved Draenei, and this is something that happened in the big aftermath of the extermination of the Draenei. So the Broken are a separate group, not the same group as Velen, even though the Broken were initially referred to as Draenei, and this led to a lot of confusion. But the point basically is, the Broken were really pissed off at the Legion, and the leader of that group of Broken, Akama, was more than happy to offer their services to Illidan, where in return for ridding the Black Temple of the Legion, it would return to Akama's people. And basically, to understand the difference between Warcraft 3 and the Burning Crusade, all you really need to know is that while Warcraft 3 was happening, Valen and his people were basically hiding in a mushroom, and we did not know that they existed. That's essentially the quick way for you to understand that whole thing but it did cause a little bit of drama at the time, because it was new lore and was seen as a bit of a ratcon. 
Now, of course, the reclamation of Black Temple was successful. The Broken infiltrated it, they powered down its defenses, and they left the gates open for Illidan, his Naga, and the Blood Elves to storm in and capture the Pit Lord Magtheridon. Illidan, of course, refused to immediately return Black Temple to Akama, instead choosing to use it as his big base of operations whilst he and the Illidari conquered the rest of Outland. Of course, the Legion wouldn't go down that easy. Kil'jaeden saw this happening, and he manifested himself right in front of Illidan atop Black Temple, telling him that he could not escape, and that Illidan's final chance was to march to Northrend and to kill the Lich King. And the time was of the essence because Arthas was planning to take the Helm of Domination for himself, which would have dire consequences for Azeroth and also for the Legion's plan. So, Ildin had to personally assault Icecrown Citadel to get out of this sticky situation, where he fatefully dueled Arthas and lost. And here is a big distinction, because in the Burning Crusade, the lore result of this duel was Illidan going completely insane. So the skull, and really Illidan talking to the skull, represents his madness. And that's why the scene of Illidan crushing that skull in Legion was a pretty powerful representation of the new direction for the lore. Like he literally destroyed the old symbol of his madness. Okay, he fails against Arthas and he's forced to go back to Outland, tail between his legs. What happened? Illidan returned to Outland having failed. So he knew the Legion was coming for him. And because of that, he decided to make the planet defensible. He ordered Lady Vash to seize the planet's scarce water reserves. That's why her Naga built Coilfang Reservoir in the heart of Zangermarsh. That was to begin stockpiling the water to control it. Then Kelfas and his Blood Elves, they were sent to the Tempest Keep in order to capture this big void craft and the narrow within. A regiment of Blood Elves then known as the Sun Reavers attempted to conquer Shatrath City. But as we know, they actually switched sides, joining the Shatar instead. Perhaps most fiendishly, Illidan began to experiment with the blood of Magtheridon, creating his own legion of bloodthirsty fell orcs. Now, Akama saw all of this stuff happening, you know, bad things of the Army of the Light, all the bad experiments, and although he once freely served Illidan, he realized that it just all went too far. He turned sides. He spoke to Maya of Shadow Song, Illidan's old jailer. And that's where Illidan's downfall was orchestrated. So we've got Team Illidan having a little bit of strife and them trying to shore up the planet. And while this was going on, Velen and the surviving Draenei decided it was time to leave their big mushroom in Zangermarsh and travel up to Netherstorm, where, of course, they captured a wing of Tempest Keep called the Exodar from the Blood Elves who had captured it, and they managed to escape the planet. Just that it didn't go so well because the Draenei were lurched into yet another crisis because some of the Blood Elves were actually still on the Exodar and they had sabotaged the engines of it. So the engines exploded and this ship went crashing down to Azeroth. This might have seemed like a big setback, but it was actually the first step in the true salvation of Vel and his people because, well, it brought them to the Alliance. And it brings us to the beginning of the Burning Crusade. So that's basically the lore that you need to know to understand the setup of the Burning Crusade. But I want to do a bit of a quick fire on some of the races and concepts that were introduced because they're kind of important. The Naru. The Naru were a really big inclusion at the time, like seriously. And Blizzard really tried to slot the Naru in everywhere, even into the Ashbringer, where developers literally told us at the time that the Naru were the most powerful entities, or at least some of the most powerful entities in the setting. Uh, yet, of course, personally, I've since defeated three of them and saw Illidan I-beam another one, one of their leaders, to death. So yes, this Naru lore was arguably the first steps into a sort of on a road, I guess, that leads us to the Chronicle chart. And since then, it's just kind of kept on going with the cosmos getting bigger, more mysterious, more dangerous, and then more explained. Uh, pumping the cosmic elements further then are the Ethereals. 
they were strange compared to most of World of Warcraft's factions, right? And, I mean, well, we'd be lost without their transmog services today. But in the Burning Crusade, they really did play two key narrative roles. First, they told us that our universe was actually full of interesting strange races. Second, their origin story of the Void Lord Dementius eating their whole world was very mysterious. It was very extreme lore that made us question what other threats were out there and also think a little bit more about Void as a dangerous thing. Then there was the Gron. It was only ever hinted at that the Gron were ancestors to the orcs and ogres, but their existence, well, it allowed us to speculate in the creation myth of the orcs. This, of course, all remains speculation until Warlords of Draenor. And then as for the orcs, well, we got to see the Maghar in this expansion. And seeing them really underpinned the transformation of the orcish people. The Maghar kind of serve as this baseline of what orcs actually are. And in a similar way, the Arakoa were introduced as another race to fill in the roster of Draenor natives. Their lore was not particularly engaging, basically just a fallen civilization ruled by a god-king, Tarok, but they had with them some pretty cool lore hints, some neat rewards, and of course a bunch of endgame content. And whilst there is more to cover here, I think this is what you need to know for the Burning Crusade, and a little bit of context of how things shifted and changed. Because this was a strange expansion that built out the lore of Outland, but in a way that was regarded as a bit of a mess. The new Draenei Eridar broken stuff, that confused many of the older fans of the RTSs, and Ilden's journey was widely disliked. Really a waste of a villain. One, of course, that Blizzard would rectify with the Legion expansion and the Illidan novel that came out around the same time, which uh, is a novel that specifically is undoing the whole insanity following the defeat at Arthas's hands, a narrative the TBC actually went with. A weird situation. So there you go, today you've really learned what you need to know for TBC. As a raider, you'll start off in Karazhan going through Medivh's spooky tower, and then after that you'll deal with Illidan's gang, which we very much have covered today before finally getting rid, for a little bit, of Kil'jaeden. That's the lore of the Burning Crusade. I hope that if you're just jumping into WoW Classic TBC for the first time, that this video helps you understand things, maybe enjoy them a little bit more. So hopefully that happened. If you'd like to support our team, you can check out the Patreon. And with that said, there's the two-part series that we did in the complete history of this expansion. It goes on for an hour and a half, so if you've got some time to kill or just want something to listen to, I'd recommend hitting it up next. Cheers, and I'll see you next time.